Hello and welcome to another episode of Making Stuff Look Good in Unity. This is Animation 102, and in this video, we're going to look at how to set up and animate a 2D character, and then drive those animations with the animator component. If you haven't worked with animation in Unity before, check out my video Animation 101, which serves as an introduction and covers the basics. We'll start with the hierarchical setup of our character. To keep things simple, we'll work with a limbless character, in the style of Rayman. Here's the root of our hierarchy, it only has an animator component attached to it. We'll want to avoid animating its transform values so that we can control them through code. For example, we'll use position for player movement and scale to handle flipping the character. Child to the root, we have the body and the feet. Keeping the feet as siblings of the body instead of as children lets us move the body without affecting the feet and give the appearance of hips that remain still as the upper body moves. The body itself has three children, the head and the two hands. The front facing hand has the weapon as a child. In the sprite import settings for the body and head, I've positioned the pivots near the hips and neck respectively. This will make it easier to animate convincing movements. This particular character is set up using order and layer instead of Z sorting, but either option would work. Before getting into animation, test out the various movements and rotations of the character to see that everything works the way we want it to. Making changes to the child-sibling relationships of transforms after you start animating requires some serious metadata hacking to fix, or you'll be forced to redo parts of your animations. Here's the idle animation of the character. It's just the head and the body bobbing up and down, but I've done some offsetting of keyframes to make it feel a lot less repetitive and generally make the animation feel more dynamic. What do I mean by offsetting the keys exactly? Take a look at this version of the idle animation. The head and hands move entirely in sync with the body, and the animation appears to move at a very obvious rhythm. We'll grab all the keyframes of the head and offset them 10 frames forward. Now it feels like the head movements are just a little delayed from the bodies. At the 90th frame, where the animation was previously ending, we'll add a new keyframe for the head and trim the old ending away. To make the head's animation loop, we'll copy and paste the new ending back onto the beginning. Now we've got a properly looping animation of the head bobbing at a slightly offbeat from the body. Previously we had all the keys set to flat interpolation to keep things looking smooth, but with the new keyframes for the head, you can see it does some awkward stopping and starting caused by the flat curve. We'll set all the keys for the head to auto interpolation instead, and the animation will smooth out nicely, without any slowdowns. I used the exact same technique of offsetting keyframes for the rotation of the front hand as well, only they were offset a whole 20 frames to create even more of an offbeat motion. Here's the idle animation with the offset keys, next to the boring idle. This technique of offsetting keyframes from your first pass animation is a great way to breathe life into your characters. Compared to an idle animation, creating a decent walk or run cycle is much more difficult. I'm by no means a professional animator, but I can give you a few tips for when you're animating a character's movement. 1. Arms and legs on the same side of the body are in opposite phase. This might seem obvious, but occasionally people get it wrong. This is something you'd quickly notice if you just got up and walked around your room. It's usually a good idea to stand up and act out an action while you animate anyway, so don't be afraid to try that. 2. Hang time should last longer than ground contact time. In my animation, I just made the airborne frames have flat interpolation to give them more time than the frames where the feet are planted on the ground. 3. Exaggerate everything. This one kind of depends on the game and the aesthetic, but for a cartoonish character like this one, great big movements and a bobbling head will make things feel much more lively. Now that we have an idle and a run animation, let's set up the animator for our character. Here's the animator window. The two animations we created have been automatically added for us. The idle state is set as the default state. This means the dwarf will be idling when the game starts. We'll add a transition from the idle state to the running state. By default, all transitions have the has exit time property set to true, meaning that the transition will occur after a certain amount of time has passed. In this case, the transition starts 83% of the way through its loop and takes 250 milliseconds to blend into the run state. We don't really want this timed state transition though, so we'll need a parameter to control when the transition should occur. In the parameters tab, we'll add a bool parameter and call it is running. Now we can add a condition to our transition stating that it will fire when is running is true. We then want to disable has exit time, otherwise the transition will only start after the idling loop is at least 83% complete and has is running true. Let's add another transition from the run state back to idle, again disable has exit time, and with the opposite condition. We can test our animator by hitting play and selecting the root object in the hierarchy. Toggling the is running parameter on causes the animator to transition into the run state, and toggling it off puts the dwarf back into his idle state. Now let's add some code to control our animator from a script. Here's a very basic character controller that lets us move left and right, and it updates the transform's local scale to face in the direction we're moving. 
Let's add some code to set that is running parameter we created in the state machine. We'll start by grabbing a reference to the animator component. It's a good idea to cache any component we'll be accessing often, instead of calling get component every frame. Now in our update method, we'll call the animator.setBool function. The first parameter will be the string is running, and the second will be an inequality statement that will evaluate to false when we're not moving and true otherwise. Back in our scene, we can test out our character. He now plays his run animation when moving and his idle when stopped. You'll notice when we start and stop, it takes the animations a bit of time to transition from one to the other. If we want the controls of our game to feel a bit snappier, we could decrease the transition time from 250 milliseconds to something a bit shorter. Even still, we only determine the character has stopped by whether or not its frame's movement is equal to zero. Because the input.getAccess function does a bit of smoothing, our run animation continues to play at full speed even as we decelerate to zero. Let's try a different approach for transitioning between idle and running. Instead of having two separate states, we'll create a blend tree and have just a single state that blends the two animations together. We'll add two motion fields to the tree and assign idle and run to the first and second fields respectively. Creating a blend tree will also automatically add another parameter to use in code called blend. We'll rename this to normalized run speed to better reflect the parameter's purpose. We can drag the root object into the preview window and hit play to test out the blend tree. Dragging the slider on the blend tree previews how various values will blend the animations together. At very slow speeds, the dwarf only shuffles his feet slightly. At mid-range values, we get a slower walk or jog. We'll set the blend tree to be the default state and not have any transitions out. Now let's change up the code to drive our new blend tree. Where we previously set the is running bool to an inequality, we'll instead set the normalized run speed to this. We'll take the absolute value of the frame movement.x. This gives us a non-negative value of x. We then divide out the run speed to give us a value between 0 and 1. Now when we test drive our dwarf, the animation more accurately maps to the smooth run speed. It's important to realize that this blend tree is dependent on the smoothing from input.getAccess. As an example, if we switch to input.getAccessRaw, our animations will have no smoothing transitioning at all, in which case the two-state boolean setup might be a better option. Personally, I prefer to get the raw input and handle any smoothing myself, but I opted to let the input manager do the smoothing here to keep the code simple. No platformer is complete without some sort of jump, so let's create an animation for that. We'll split jump into two parts, the actual jump that fires right away, and a falling animation that plays shortly after. My falling animation is just a single frame, but you can also make the dwarf kick his feet or flap his arms as he falls. In the jump animation's import settings, we'll untick the loop time property. This makes it so that the animation will hold on its last frame after it's played once instead of looping indefinitely. Our state machine is going to need some new parameters now. We'll add two bools, one for is grounded and another for is falling. The transition from our blend tree to the jump state occurs as soon as grounded is false. It's also a very short transition. The transition from jump to the falling state occurs when is falling becomes true. And finally, falling transitions back to our blend tree when is grounded becomes true again. I've added a hacky bit of code to quickly give us jumping and gravity. We'll also need to set the new bool parameters of our animator. Is grounded is just set to our grounded state, which in turn is controlled by the new y axis code. For is falling, we'll set it to the inequality y velocity less than zero. So what we'd expect to see is our jump animation play and hold on the last frame until the maximum jump height is reached, at which point gravity will bring our y velocity below zero and the dwarf will switch to his falling animation as he begins to fall. We now have a character that can run and jump. It doesn't look half bad and might actually make a good start to a game. I'll include a link in the description to the assets used in this video along with a couple of bonus sprites you can use to throw together some sort of game using this guy. All assets are released under the Creative Commons Attribution License, so go nuts with them. Special thanks to this week's patrons on Patreon, you the best. And as always, thank you all for watching, keep on making those video games.